One of the things with AI that I think is going to be readily apparent here pretty soon is that it's going to be so intelligent that it will be able to solve some of the major engineering problems that we have. First of all, energy. If we were to get some sort of solution to unlimited energy, think of how that could change the world. We would basically be able to desalinate all the ocean water we wanted to, to kind of, you know, make desert areas lush and fertile. Obviously that will change land. Fundamentally how we view land, it'll fundamentally change what pieces of land are valuable and what are not. Does this mean so, I'm gonna have to tell people like, stop buying desert squares? I'm not saying that desert squares are gonna become valuable anytime soon, but you have to really, I think, take a look at how we're looking at land and sort of adapt to where we think it's going. Welcome to the Turning Profit Podcast. Heather, it's so great to be here once again. Yeah, yeah, it's wonderful. Okay, that's all you have to say? <laughs> is that funny? Like, I think it is wonderful. I but, mean, but we're like married. We've been married for a gazillion years. So it's like, like it is good to be seeing you, but it's not like I haven't seen you. Okay. Yes. You know what I mean? Like yes. we're not like random people. So. Okay. But yes. speaking of random people, are we talking about random things today? What are we talking no, about? No, no. We've got a really, really exciting topic today. And we are talking about the future of land. You say that sometimes um, sarcastically, but you actually are super excited oh, about yes. this. Yes. I've gone down a whole big rabbit hole on the future of land and um, why we're involved in the land business in the first place and what the future of the land business is going to be. So at least what, what I think it's gonna be. How we're gonna make the future. You know, we could say, oh, this is what the future is, but this is what we plan to do with the future. Right, so. yeah, so we're taking a look at big trends and big things that we believe are gonna happen in the land side of things mm -hmm. and then kind of crafting our business to sort of match that and take advantage of it. Right. And a lot of this comes from, we know ourselves well enough to know that, you know, okay, so you get into land and you make money doing just like kind of the flipping stuff. And then what, like, what do you, what do you do at that point? Right. Mm -hmm. And I think we know ourselves well enough to know that like, we might not necessarily want to be the people who actually run a rental business. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's true? Oh yeah. No, no, that doesn't excite me at all. Right. So. I mean, we could do it. Sure. Mm -hmm. But I don't want to be a landlord in that sense. Like I don't want I don't want to actively be a landlord. Mm -hmm. We've had great experiences and we've had some that are just like not what we love, right. right? So, and I think a lot of people go down that path. They're like, okay, I'll flip land to make money mm -hmm. to live off of, but you're going to have extra money right? if you do it right. And then what do you do from there? Like, where do, where do you take it up a notch? Because a lot of people that get into this kind of thing, I think they like to keep leveling up. You and, know? and that's the way we are, you know, right. always looking to, to do more, to grow more, to mm -hmm. level up. Right. And to keep that excitement factor going. And I think right. it's okay to admit that, mm -hmm. you know, you hear about like, we always talk about celebrities that steal, you know, and you're always like, well, why they have plenty of money. I'm like, it's a, it's the thrill. If that's your type of thing where you're, I'm not, I'm like more conservative than you are, but I think we both like, we want to keep it exciting. Yes. So I think a lot of these things will be a lot of, will encourage a lot of excitement in people and you let your mind wander and it'll be like the sky's the limit. The sky is the limit. And what are you most excited about right now? I know I just cut you off. Well, I'm most excited about AI <laughs> I was and how you up. it's, how it's going to change the world. We're really on the brink of some, some really big things happening. And I know that, um, you know, last year, actually the end of 2022 mm -hmm. is when chat GPT kind of hit the world and sort of changed a lot of things. And I think that was sort of a moment when people really understood or maybe started to grasp some of the ideas of what AI could be used for and how it could potentially change things. So, but ChatGPT is really just the scratching the surface. Mm -hmm. So ChatGPT is, I think, an illustration of how smart an AI mm -hmm. can be, maybe? Well, it's an introduction to the masses. Mm -hmm. That's yes. the big thing. It, it's been so, it's easy to use, so then you can see the value in it. Right. There was this thing on, people were talking about, like, ask your, like, partner, um, your, if it, a male that, when was the last time they, they thought of the, what was that? The Roman Empire? The right, Roman Empire, yeah. Yes. And, like, your Roman Empire is AI. I'm deep down the rabbit hole of it mm -hmm. right now. Well, not as not as deep as, as other people are that have been involved with AI for the mm -hmm. last 10 years or something right, like that. Right. But, but I'm very fascinated in how it's going to change the world. I already use it. I, I can't even tell you how many times I've used it. Personally, uh, business-wise, all these kinds of things. I can tell it, like, okay, explain this to me. And I'll be like, okay, now really simplify it for me. Like, depending on, like, my mind level, right? Mm -hmm. and that's the thing is that it's um, it, it's accessible, you know, and it's all about at learning how to use it. And I'm not scared of it. I've been a content creator for years and years and years, right? Mm -hmm. And I don't, at no point am I all up in arms over that. And right. I know there's a lot of content creators that will completely think I'm whatever. Sold out. 
And that's cool. I understand. But I live in the mindset that great. It's a new tool that can help me create even more. Right. I think the next phase we're going to we're we're already in, but I think that we're really going to be doubling down on here is using these AI tools to kind of supercharge whatever we do. So that's the next phase of things. Eventually, many think that AI will replace jobs or maybe fundamentally change jobs that people are Mm -hmm. doing. You know, the jobs that people are doing are really going to fundamentally shift when there's AIs that can do all the thinking and creative jobs way better than humans can do. Right. So Right. um, With less air, more strategic. They can work when you're sleeping. They don't have to sleep. I think if I was going to be somebody who was like, I'm getting into AI, I would be of the mindset, uh, or I I should even say if I'm a creative and I'm thinking, okay, well, how can I use this? I'm going to learn how to create the prompts to get what they need. Cause that's where the, the, that's where the gatekeeping is going to be. Mm-hmm. You know, when, if you know how to, to use it, to do what you need and right. by prompts, I don't mean just like prompts, but like if you can harness that and use your creative energy to have it create your vision, yep. you know what I mean? Like you think of it this way, if I'm someone who makes logos, right. And I know my general vision, if I could put it into it and kind of write it out. And I know those kind of weird things I want that other, not weird, but like special things other people don't, I can be where it would take me like, I don't make logos, by the way, just okay. throwing this out there. Yeah. But you know what I mean? Like it might take me all day to do one, but this I could do maybe six in that amount of time. And I'm still, cre- you know, keeping that creative juices. Um, and so for, for land specific, what do you see? One of the things with AI that I think is going to be readily apparent here pretty soon is that it's going to be so intelligent that it will be able to solve some of the major engineering problems that we have. And they're kind of on the, the, um, you know, the minds of many people. First of all, energy. Energy mm-hmm. has been a big thing for many, uh, many generations, you know, is ever since the, the automobile, you know, it, oil has become kind of like the, you know, oil is, is the gold. So, and it's caused wars and, you know, all, all types of- Still does. Uh, it still yeah. does, yes. And obviously, if we were to, to get some sort of uh, some sort of solution to unlimited energy, think of how that could change the world. And and people are talking about how that's going to happen with with fusion. So fusion is a is a technology that basically fusion is is what um, produces all the energy from the sun. So they're trying to duplicate that and make that into something that can produce unlimited kind of cheap energy. Mm-hmm. So if the world had unlimited cheap energy, I mean, what could we do? It would be cleaner energy. I think that's the, yeah, the other focus. Yeah. hundred percent clean energy. Right. So that would be the focus. We would basically be able to desalinate as much water, all the ocean water we wanted mm-hmm. to, to kind of, you know, make desert areas, you know, lush and fertile, kind of like the Nile. You or know? just we, us in California could have water. Yes. And not be like freaked out, <laughs> right. you know. We could remove all the carbon from the atmosphere so to reverse, you know, global warming mm-hmm. and all the all the damage that we've done to the environment. So there's a lot of a lot of things that we, we can farm underground, mm-hmm. you know, in some of these really, really hot climates. We could set up huge underground farming to, you know, produce as much food as we want because mm-hmm. we'll have the energy to, to run all the lights and all the infrastructure that, that is uh, uh, going along with that. So, well, I think the tie in because it, it just is popping in my head and, you know, I can't control myself is. And that's what I was getting to yeah. is that obviously that will change land. Right. Exactly. That, that will change fundamentally how we view land. It'll fundamentally change what pieces of land are valuable and what are not. Does this mean so, I'm going to have to tell people, like, stop buying desert squares to... <laughs> well, maybe I, I don't know. Like... I'm, not, I'm not saying that desert squares are going to become valuable anytime soon. But you have to really, I think, take a look at at how we're, we're you know, as far as a long-term perspective, how we're looking at, at land and some of these our long-term plans with things and sort of adapt to where we think it's going. Right. So maybe so. you could have some that are, like, on the cusp where... Right now, they're not really buildable because the deserts are limited by their water. Mm-hmm. Or, I mean, I, I shouldn't even say water because sometimes they have ample water, water mm-hmm. supply. But uh, to places where the water is an issue and you think, okay, well, I'll, maybe I will buy it really cheap and it's my 50-year retirement plan. Mm-hmm. Or it's my kid's plan for or my grandkids or whatever. Like maybe in some senses, if you're looking at it that way, that that direction and it's cheap enough, maybe that was that would make sense, right? Yep. But also, well, you go, you go the next one. Yeah, so obviously AI is going to change a lot of jobs. It's going to replace some, some jobs initially. It's also going to change how we interact with, with the, the new technology as well. So there'll be new jobs created. There will be existing jobs that will be kind of done away with because of the technology. And I think the centralized nature of, of a lot of the work that we do, you know, living in large cities and 
big urban areas and things like that will be less important. So I think generally this technology will cause a migration of people away from the larger cities and, and settling some of these more rural areas that, you know, up until this point, it's hard to make a living in some of these areas. But mm -hmm. with the availability of the internet and the changing, you know, role of, of kind of humans and, and all this new technology, I think it will lend itself to, you know, creating sort of newer population areas and, and areas outside of those big cities, basically making some of the rural areas more valuable and maybe some of the cities less valuable. But but I don't really know. Maybe maybe that's not the case. And maybe the cities will always, you know, New York City is probably always going to retain value. But I know. think that's a different reason. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like a, a mecca of artists. Like It might shift who lives there, mm -hmm. but it's not going to shift the people that visit, maybe. Right. Yeah. You know? I think people will still have a desire, you know, a certain set of people will certainly have always a desire to communicate in person. Right, you know? right. Uh, so, and there'll be a certain subset of, of society that has no desire to communicate with people in person. Right. You know what I'm excited about is that if it creates more opportunity for people who don't have to be centralized to one location, which I think COVID kind of did because work from home and those technologies became a lot more universal. Right. Like before, we, we loved doing Zoom stuff and we were doing it way before that, but it became more uh, accessible and um, understood and people weren't as scared of it because they were forced to do it. Right. I think the other thing is they say that one of the, the keys to long life, long happy life, whatever, is um, connections in your community. And a lot of people are torn from their communities because of, you know, you still have to make money. Right. It's yeah. like, great, yeah, I want to be all, around all my friends, but can't make enough money here. Right. Whereas if there's more tools that help make that happen, you know, hopefully we have a, a healthier population mentally and physically. That ties into another thing. AI should really increase the quality of life with people, you know, primarily the health side of things mm -hmm. uh, with lots of advancements and research going into longevity. And there's a lot of people out there that believe that we'll be able to actually reverse the aging process. I heard this thing a number of years ago, which I always think about. It's like, hey, the first person that's going to live to 200 years old has already been born. Mm -hmm. So who knows if that's true? But obviously this technology is ramping up at such a pace and an exponential pace that many of these complex and, and very sort of unsolvable problems will be able to be solved. Because um, a computer is not limited by anyone telling it it's, you know, eh, it'll never happen. Why mm -hmm. are you wasting your time? Can't make money doing that. A computer doesn't have those limitations. Mm -hmm. A computer is just, you know, it's it's really just probability. And I shouldn't say a computer, but um, AI and computer is probability. It's all the knowledge of the world. Can you imagine if we took the smartest person, that the advanced most advanced person in, in a certain type of cancer, and then we implanted an AI brain and they were able to absorb every single thing about every fruit, every plant, every, I mean, yeah, yeah, it's insane. That's that I can't, I can't, my brain can't even process the level of um, advancements that can come from that. Being able to kind of map all the systems of the body, you know, obviously mm -hmm. I'm not a medical, medical professional in any way, but being able to map all the complex systems of the body, which you know, haven't been, I mean, it's, we, we've done certain things, you know, uh, along those lines, but we're no, we're near like figuring out how everything interacts with the body, like down to a molecular level and everything. So once that can all be mapped uh, and the computers can figure out how to, you know, the AI can figure out how to solve certain problems, mm -hmm. diseases, reverse aging, lots of things like that, that's, that's going to change society as a whole. So when it comes to land, obviously that will um, that will change a lot of things. And some of those things are yet to be determined how they will change. But Well, there's going to be things that we don't even know are going to be like AI is going to create opportunities in use of land mm -hmm. that we don't know of now. Yeah. And that's one of the things, too, that I wanted to mention is advanced agricultural techniques. Right. So obviously, if we are able to sort of extend life expectancy of, of, of the population, mm -hmm. then, you know, it would stand to reason that you know, the population is really going to continue to grow over time, which means that we will have to get more and more efficient with our agriculture to, to, feed, to everybody. feed everybody. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. those are advanced agricultural techniques and making better use of the land that we have, I think mm. will become really important as well. And along the same lines is we're going to need more houses. We're going to need more. If people live longer, do you hear that study? That everyone's all up in arms that boomers aren't selling their houses. So millennials can't buy the right. family homes that they need. Right. It's where they skipped... Um, 
Gen X. Like, yeah, there was a, so we're the forgotten generation. I, but that's so okay. That's all right. Like, I don't mind. I know, me too. It was funny, though. They were like, oh, how the generations, I saw this graphic, and I was like, oh, okay. So I'm like, <laughs> okay, whatever. That goes along the lines that we're going to need um, bigger houses. Millennials are having children. Yep. I mean, actually, they might even be a, finished having children at this point. But Gen Z is going to come up. How, what are they, you know, Gen A or whatever they're calling all these other ones. If people live longer, and if people are retiring and dying in their in their the homes they raise their children, they're not moving to smaller places. Like that cycle is not continuing, which I don't blame them. Like right. I'm not mad at boomers at all. Like right. if they want to live in there, I, you know, go for it. It's on, it's society that needs to come up with solutions for that though, because what was working before or the system that was happening before is not happening now, which means that we need more um, low cost housing. We need more, you know, and also we need infrastructure to help people who are aging because aging yeah. populations need more things, which means more land for these support services. Yeah. So all in all, it's 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 going to be interesting. Yeah. I think we're already there and these services are needed. We just haven't caught up. And then there's a whole line of thought about, say, AI gets to the point and many people think that it's going to get to this point in 15 to 20 years where you know, most jobs are actually replaced. And in a situation like that, how does the, the government, you know, get tax dollars? You know, if they're not able to oh, tax their income, yeah, tax their income, how mm -hmm. are they going to how are they going to to fuel everything they need in order to to, to get by? So mm -hmm. obviously, in a situation like that, then the assets become become the key. You know, mm -hmm. it's it's assets like companies, you know, mm -hmm. large companies and companies that are making money and, and doing things. Those are assets. And obviously, um, Land, real estate ownership. That's those are that those are the other assets. So. We had like a talk about that, and you were like, "I think the only way is for it is like some sort of asset ba based taxing." Mm -hmm. And I was like, "No, hell no." Yes. And it was like our, we were in a car. And I was like, "No, no, I'm not okay with that." And you're like, "Well, what do you?" And you know, and I was like throwing all these things like, well, "We have can't property work. taxes already." Uh, mm -hmm. So it, but those those go to the locals. You know, well, those go to the local it. municipality. Okay. I'm not doing it. Okay. Well, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, but you know, along the lines of jobs being replaced, so. When I think of, I don't want to go to an AI dermatologist. Although maybe that's the best because they can see sunspots. They, they actually might be better at identifying you yes. know, changes in skin than a human would be. But I still want a human to overlook that. Now, if I go buy a sandwich, I, I would rather a machine do it because my sandwich order is weird. And 99% of the time, because I don't want meat on it, right? Yeah. They'll still put, the, like she must want turkey. Okay, so I'm okay with that. I think in the land thing, I think valuations, if AI gets really good and understands nuances, like if they can go and do all the steps you do, like, okay, we'll look at the hillside. Like if it can get really good at understanding those kinds of nuances, I think I would almost trust AI more than right. you. Not that I think you do a bad job. But it's, it's exact. And it takes in all the data, you know, right. not just what I see. Right. Yeah. And then the other thing, too, though, is that, like, let's say it's 8 p.m. and you're doing it and you're not really the best at 8 p.m. at night. Right. No. So 8 p.m. Pete's totally different than 8 a.m. Pete. Mm -hmm. And this A.I. doesn't have like the off time. It's not lacking on caffeine. It hasn't had a long day. It didn't deal with the teenager this morning. But I still want you to look over it and make sure that like there's mm -hmm. not something obvious because it, it makes mistakes. Right. But eventually it probably won't be. So you think it'll mistakes. it'll be. OK, so. I think when we think of people are scared that it's going to replace jobs, I think it's going to create different jobs. And if I were looking at that, I would be thinking how, you know, it just goes back to that thing. Like it actually might provide better quality of life for people, for workers, because if they can get done their job, you know, in less time with less stress, if the, if the AI is doing this, the part they hate. I'm an optimist. That's the outcome that I foresee. Right. But obviously it could go in a lot of different directions. But I, I think, I think overall it's going to be a, a really good positive thing, but you know, ultimately we'll see. Right. I mean, yeah, it could take over the world and, and <laughs> authorize it to like, you know, get rid of all of us or yeah. drain all of our Ob bank obviously accounts. Obviously there's, there's always going to be people that use the technology for evil, evil purposes. Yes. <laughs> so we just need to keep those people in check for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we talked about changing jobs and mm -hmm. unlimited power. I think mm -hmm. that's a very, very exciting, you know, potential thing, you know, how, how that could affect land use. And then advanced agricultural techniques, mm -hmm. demographic trends shifting from the larger cities that, that will have a, a big impact as well. More rural areas becoming accessible due to internet availability and the remote work side of things. I heard a really interesting statistic that kind of doesn't really have anything to do with this, but I need to share it anyways, is that there's a huge percentage of 
um, police and fire, those kinds of work, first um, response workers that live in like Boise area. And they commute to California to do their work. Just work like three days a week or something yeah, and they, then go back home uh-huh. for four or something? Yeah, so, they have three or four day shifts. And they like the firefighters just they sleep in the house anyways. I don't know how the, the police or sheriff kind of people do that. Maybe they do the same kind of or they have a crash pad like a pilot mm-hmm. would. But I think it's already starting to happen yeah. because you would think of jobs that are primarily like local that that doesn't seem like someone who would commute in. But their dollar goes. They like the lifestyle. They like for whatever, you know, all these different things. I think that's interesting because we're going to see more of that too. Yeah. Especially when we get advancements into like personal drones and things like that. Could you imagine though, because they're driving in or they're flying in. Could you imagine? Yeah. If you just hop in your thing and you just like program it, go to sleep and wake up and wake up and you're there. Yeah. Hit the firehouse and you're like, okay, I'm here to work. (laughs) But isn't that kind of interesting though? Because You know, there were some people that were also saying, I was reading the comments, which you should never do. And they were like, they should be mandated to live in the state so that the taxpayers stay there. Hmm. And I was like, that's an odd take. Mm -hmm. That's a very odd take to me. I would never have jumped to like, if you're going to be a fireman here, you know, because I think that's actually very common. We had at one point a neighbor who was a fireman. We lived in San Diego County and he was a fireman in like LA, right? Yeah. I Mm -hmm. didn't bat an eye like, well, you're t- I hope you're buying all your toilet paper in San Diego, man, or L.A., because you're getting paid up there. <laughs> yeah. Um. So we have to get through. A lot of people have um have interesting views that we're not taking into account for all this to progress. Because mm-hmm. there's a lot of people that are fighting AI instead of leaning into it and say, how can it make my life better? Right. Which, by the way, isn't that the whole point of life? You got to progress. You got to evolve. Oh, I meant that it to have a good life. Well, yes, that's yes, that's yeah. the ultimate goal. Right. Have like, a good life. Right. Isn't that the whole goal? Yeah. I mean, is to to find inner fulfillment and happiness like i don't know but some people come at it as like uh, no progress can't happen you know what i mean that's strange well you know there's always going to be people fighting for the status quo Mm -hmm. to not change things i mean obviously when the automobile was introduced the all the carriage manufacturers (laughs) <laughs> they, they really, they were, up in arms. They really <laughs> they were up in arms and I'm sure that they didn't want these Punk. automobiles, you know, <laughs> like being on the same streets. And there's probably lots and lots of mm-hmm. friction about that part. You know, ultimately, the technology is going to win. It's it's not it's not a, a battle that the carriage makers would ever win. Like mm-hmm. there's a superior thing out there. That's what people are going to gravitate towards. It's not they're going to not going to go back to the carriages and the horse drawn things like why. And the ones that probably did OK were the ones who were like, well, again, I'm going to start a division selling automobiles. Right. Do you want a carriage or do you want right. you're coming here for a carriage? But would you rather have an automobile? And- and I'm sure there are still carriage makers that exist today, but they've they've they're different. You know, they're probably not doing any sort of like mass production things. They're probably doing specialized type things for events, or you know, who knows what they're doing. But or Amish or Mennonite, yeah, I don't like, know, or, or not Mennonite, you know, like the ones you see, you know, like horse drawn carriages around oh, New yeah. York City or something. Mm-hmm. You know, they're they're still making them. I've, mm-hmm. I've, I've, I've bet, but it's different. So fighting the technology, I think, is a lost battle. I think it's a it's a matter of trying to determine where things are going. And as one of my favorite quotes that I always say is skate to where the puck is going, not to where it's been. I wonder if Wayne Gretzky really said that. I don't know. <laughs> he's, you know, supposedly he has. So okay. well, uh, he I, has a couple of good he's quotes. Right, no, there. but that's actually like a truth in hockey. Mm-hmm. Yes. Like, so it's not, it's, we use it as a metaphor to, for life, but it truly is like. Yeah. Maybe it just meant about like, you got to skate, you know, like head of the puck if uh-huh. you're going to like get yeah, it. You got to, by the time you get over there, it's going to be up here. So we're like, this is Wayne Gretzky's life uh, lessons. We're like, I'll hail Wayne Gretzky. But he's like, dude, I was just saying like, if you want to win the game. Hockey. Yeah. yeah but whatever sorry, but, weirdos. <laughs> that's um, too funny. Yeah, but I think we, and we talk about this too, that we're look, going to be looking at each step of our business for the land investing and saying, how how can AI enhance this? Mm-hmm. How can it make it easier for our employees? How can it make it easier for us? How can we be more exact? How can we improve? How can we improve every aspect? And then we're going to have to keep doing that over and over again because it's going to keep changing. Yeah. So by the time we get done saying, okay, we're going to optimize it this way, we're going to revisit and say, okay, what's the newest technology? Yeah. And the thing that I am sure of, without a doubt, these changes are going to come faster than, than we think. So we're, we're going to be kind of hit over the head with some of these things as some of these new advancements come out. And the ones that adapt the quickest, I think, are going to be the ones that, that prosper the most during this transition period, for sure. Well, I know for a fact, anytime that we've flundered or, or not excelled, it's because I've held us back because it's, I don't like change. Mm-hmm. And you're supposed to say no, Heather. Okay, that's well, not. I don't know. Like, what, yes. I'm trying to understand what floundered means. Uh, <laughs> floundered. Oh, floundered. <laughs> okay. Floundered. Add that to the list of things I say wrong that I'm so, so sure are correct. I don't like change. And, right. You and know, I'm, you, you know, know, and I'm one of those people, but I accept that and I push myself. But um, I know that um, it's something that, that you're super excited about. This is something that you're, 
you're really um, excited about. So yeah, I would say get in on it. I mean, we're not even at that, like we're like far from um, early adopters, but we're also far from old adopters because right. there's just so much. So Right. Yeah. So lots of big things coming. I know things are going to be changing and maybe someone listening to this is going to say this is all and it's not going to all happen. Wow, we'll see. bad word. Huh? Well, yeah, so that's a really bad uh, word, Heather. I think that the people that I think are the smartest, I don't hate that word, in this are the people who admit that could go anyway and that you mm -hmm. don't know. Right. I'm sick of people with definitives. Yeah. I respect people who don't have definitives. They say, like, this is how I feel like it's going, but, um, you know, we'll have to, based off of this past experience or what I'm seeing, but we're going to have to see. And that's the reality, but that's why you've got to stay like fluid and mm -hmm. you have to be open to change and just to go with it. Yeah, that's right. Live in the present. Yep. Yeah. The other thing that I did want that I did have down here that I did want to mention about the future of land and land use is I think there's going to be a lot more land in the future that's going to be taken up by uh, renewable energy, you know, not uh, kind of as a stepping stone maybe to the fusion technology, which, you know, a lot of people envision is going to be the future, but that would be obviously solar and also wind farms. Mm -hmm. So land use, you know, there's a big, big push to change the electrical grid in the U.S. to 100% renewable energy by the year 2035, which actually is rapidly approaching. You and think that's possible? That sounds... I mean, probably not. It's probably mm -hmm. not going to happen. But obviously, we've got a lot of fossil fuels that are kind of powering our electric grid now, you know, like natural gas, coal even still. There's a lot of coal-fired mm -hmm. plants out there. So obviously, switching them over to solar farms or wind farms would be a great benefit to the, the environment for sure. Yeah, so. I think one of the big challenges to that is I was looking at air quality, like just around our kids have allergies. And I was like, what's going on here? And I kind of zoomed out and I was like, holy heck, what's going on in Poland? It's like horrible air quality. And I didn't go deep into this, but coal, hmm. pretty much it's coal. They're, they're a coal fired economy, huh? Yeah. So we're going, and I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on in that area of the world too. So it's not so easy as like, okay, you and I are committed to, I have a flex fuel car, you know, where I can a plug in hybrid. You have just an all electric car. The girl's car that they drive is also a plug in hybrid. Like we're committed to it, but we come from like a place of, I guess, privilege where, you yeah, know. And plus we're plugging into the outlet where who knows where that power actually, like right. how that power was generated. Uh -huh. So that's, that's the ultimate thing. Like obviously the main source of how that power is generated is to, to make it, you know, it's you know. bigger than just that. I would love right. to get solar here on mm -hmm. our houses, but I think that there's still going to be um, a percentage of homes that it's, that's just not going to be practical. It'll never be practical, mm -hmm. necessarily. not the way that it is now. Right. So, but if we have these big, you know, electric um, solar farms everywhere that, like you said, we could draw from and that would probably be the more logical step. And then we just have to kind of work towards the uh, areas that don't have the same opportunities as we do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but I guess everything we do here helps any everywhere, really. Right. Okay. So kind of after sort of digging into mm -hmm. what we believe is the future of land, how are we going to take advantage of that in our own business? Mm -hmm. How are we positioning our own business to kind of look towards the future, which we believe will happen? Take it away, Pete. Oh, okay. <laughs> so first of all, we've got our kind of main core business mm -hmm. where we are buying and selling land. So mm -hmm. that's not going to change. We're not changing what we do in, in that at all. So like we buy properties, generally we buy them off market. Sometimes we do some improvements to those properties. A lot of times we do, mm -hmm. you know, minor improvements. And then we resell those properties, kind of a short term hold thing. Mm -hmm. So obviously when you're doing things really short term like that, you're not as susceptible to the long term shifts that are happening. Good or bad. Yeah, good or, good or bad. Yes, right, yeah, exactly. You're trying to just hit that moment in time mm -hmm. like, Right now, I think this property is worth more than what I'm able to acquire it for, or after I'm able to do some minor improvements, what it's worth after those improvements, and uh, and resell it and make a profit that way. So we're going to continue to do that, continue to scale up that business. Nothing has changed there. Like we love that business, actually, I do at least, and there's Wait, still a lot of, lot of opportunity. Hmm? I do too. Okay. All right. You do too? Yeah. Right. You like it when the wire transfers come in, right? Exactly. Okay. Not when they go out though. No, because yeah, I, just, <laughs> I feel like I'm money's being ripped out of my like out of my hands. Isn't that funny? But then also I came to you and I was like, hey, we haven't bought anything this week and I'm getting I nervous. Know, You're like, wait I a know. minute, I thought you hated sending wires, make it make sense. Yeah, yeah, true. They're hard one to figure out, Heather. 
Yeah. So you, you're, it was your choice. Okay. You chose to partner with me. So yeah. <laughs> who's the fool? Yeah, I, yeah. There's no fools here. Uh, good, good answer. There's no way you could come out of that one. Yeah. So just let it go. So we've got those and that, that's going to continue strong. There's a lot of opportunity in that space. That opportunity will will be there for the foreseeable future and will probably always be there. Mm-hmm. There are always going to be people buying and selling. There are always going to be opportunities to improve the value of a property and, and do that on a short term basis. So we're planning to continue with that and scale that up as much as we possibly can. Next, kind of the next step is doing some larger short-term projects. Mm-hmm. When, when I talk about that, I mean subdivisions, mm-hmm. minor subdivisions. You mean like shorter, t- shorter, shorter term. Yeah. So not these as are short. Yeah. yeah. So these maybe are not like close on it and then listed, you know, for sale the next day. Mm-hmm. But maybe you know you can be ready to sell in a month or two, something mm-hmm. like that. So these are things like splitting properties. Mm-hmm. So buying a large property, segmenting it into smaller properties. Say we buy 100 acres, segmenting it into 10, 10 acre properties, and then reselling those to those indiv- individuals uh, at a profit. So mm-hmm. when you do that, obviously you can buy something in bulk, kind of like the Costco thing. You buy something in bulk, you get it for a better price. When you split it up and sell it off individually, uh, then you can sell it for a lot more. Just like if you were to have a case of water, buy the case of water for you know six dollars, mm-hmm. and you could sell each bottle for you know a dollar. So you would you know it's the same bucks, type of concept. Yeah, yeah. So you just see that all the time. Actually, I saw someone sent me or not sent me, but I saw a reel of that. Some guys like here's the things I go to Costco and I buy, and he's like these are ten dollars for twenty four of them, and I sell them for two fifty each. Yeah. Someone was like, is this like they they were like talking to is this illegal? I was like, <laughs> that's how businesses make money. They buy in bulk, they buy wholesale and mm-hmm. they sell retail. It's, you know, yeah. there's no there's no no uh, magic to that. It's just mm-hmm. what business has been well, for, for, like, uh, for years. Yeah, go to a concession. She's uh-huh. at, like at a, at a, you know, high school game yeah. or something like that. That's that's where they get that. Right. And the person's like, really? I never. I'm like, oh, man. Yeah. So obviously that is a uh, that is very appealing to us. Mm-hmm. We want to do more and more of those lot split opportunities. Uh, there's some other opportunities that are kind of um, along those lines, mm-hmm. but they may be more. Uh, a little bit more complicated value add projects. It could be something like putting in a road to access a property that's not really accessible right now. It could be some other sort of uh, minor projects, but a little bit more in the more involved with the value add type stuff. So we're really focusing on ramping those types of things up. So these are shorter term things, really not impacted much by the long term trends in the land business. Although I feel like the 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 lot splitting thing is kind of catering to the migration of people outside of the large cities, kind of the demographic mm-hmm. trends of work from wherever or you know step away from some of those urban centers. And I think we're really catering to that. I feel like the rural land is well positioned to kind of take advantage of that. There's a lot of people, especially around here, that it's just about be, being in a place they can afford. Yep. And they're, they're trading their time for an affordable house, which makes sense, you know? I mean, ideally, yeah, it'd be great if you're 10 minutes from your job, but if, the, if your rent or your mortgage is gonna be three times the amount, it might be worth that half hour, hour drive even every day. Yep. Or, you know, each way even. So I think a lot of times when you're doing like the outskirts of the city, that's the target audience, you yeah. know, yep. or target market, not target, target audience. Yeah. yeah. So we are going to be doing as many of those shorter term projects as possible. In addition, we are going to be working on longer term projects. So these are kind of long term value add projects with land and pretty much my focus that I want to do is focus on renewable energy projects, Mm -hmm. developing for solar farms or developing for wind farms. No different than what you would do if you would buy a a large tract of land and develop it for a housing development. I mean, Mm -hmm. it's kind of similar type processes and things that you need to go through, hire an engineering firm to kind of uh, run that project and maybe someone on your team to oversee it. So those um, those things are are really going to be a focus going forward. So obviously we'll do all the short term stuff. But then we will be working on some of the long term projects that would be, you know, potentially more of home run type things. So, mm-hmm. like, obviously, they're going to take a long time to come to fruition. But when they do, then obviously there's a tremendous amount of value that is achieved. Mm-hmm. So and obviously we've got to invest money to make those things happen. But but I really see a lot of opportunities, especially in that renewable energy space. So I think that there's a lot of opportunity for us in on the kind of financial side of things, meaning that one thing I have listed is be the bank. Mm-hmm. So what my idea with that is that we will structure a fund, mm-hmm. um, you know, a financial fund, investment fund for people where 
this fund, its sole mission is going to be providing financing for people to buy our properties that we sell. Mm -hmm. So essentially be holding the note, holding the mortgage for this piece of land. And obviously the person buying that piece of land is then making the payments to the, um, the, the fund that we set up. Mm -hmm. So obviously this will help us sell our properties quicker, but then it'll also provide great opportunities for investors that are looking for that, that cash flow, that, that, those, that regular income at a good rate of return. So, so if you're an expert at this, <laughs> yes, no, I'm currently looking for an expert yeah. in, in uh, you know, investment funds and things like that. So if you are an expert, please reach out to me. I would love to talk to you. And then also kind of uh, along those same lines, but a whole different focus would be a long-term fund, uh, mm -hmm. a long-term hold fund. And this is not a, a fund for people that are interested in getting that, you know, the regular income, but are looking at the, at land mm -hmm. as a long-term viable investment. So the goal with this would be to buy up large tra tracks of quality properties, mm -hmm. either farmland, you know, that's producing farmland that we're going to just keep as farmland. And over time, you know, those should be more and more valuable or properties, the large properties that are kind of in that path of progress that we see like three, five, seven, 10 years mm -hmm. down the road, that they should be much more valuable based mm -hmm. off of the trends that we're seeing. So like those ones, we'd try to time the market more right. than, than just we're right. selling it now today. In some cases, you, you know areas that are growing and, and you know areas that will continue to grow over time. And you could look at a map and you could, you could tell, you could tell what's going to be more valuable in the future. And right. obviously, you know, a year from now, it might not have changed too much, but 10 years from now, you're pretty certain that that would be a, a great investment. So a lot of those uh, longer term hold things, I think is, is a really good opportunity for people to kind of diversify their por portfolios. Maybe they've got certain percentage invested in stocks, certain percentage invested in, you know, uh, other types of assets. But, but land, I think, is one of those asset classes that is always going to be valuable. Uh, and should uh, should do well over time, you know, based off of all these concepts that we're talking about today. Really kind of excited for that because we run into a lot of good opportunities. They may not be a great opportunity to buy and, and resell shortly, but quality properties that we're able to acquire at uh, a good price. And I think that um, I, don't, I don't like walking away from those opportunities. So I'd love to have a vehicle where we can invest in those type of properties and, you know, make it a win-win for everyone involved. Right. It all comes down to having the, the team available so we can do the highest and best. Right. You, so where we actually take it, you're like, this one piques my interest for X reason. And then we throw it to the team and they say, this is, you know, they each work through the different scenarios and, and then say, here's what we've got. And then we go with that. Yep. And we have the fun behind it to, to really do it. Because a lot of people are like, how can we get involved? And they, you know, we have ways where people can get involved now. Right. But a lot of people have that um, extra extra money sitting there that they don't want to do just the traditional. Right. Yeah. And, you know, obviously one of the one of the keys to investing is to kind of diversify your portfolio, spread the risk around, especially when you've got a society that's going to be changing so rapidly based off of the technology that's coming. I think it's wise to at least set aside a portion of your portfolio into land. Buying quality pieces of land, I think, is one of the best things that you can do. That's always going to retain its value. OK, so are we... Um segmenting to our next yeah yeah well let's uh let's dive into the next portion of our program which is answering the questions from our land flipping community which is called landconquest.com if you've never listened to the podcast before that you probably never heard us mention that so landconquest.com is our community that's completely focused on our business model of buying and selling land for short-term holds we've got an extensive training program that we provide to all community members at no cost. Very good. Did Where I do they that find it? Right? Yes, that's, yep. S yeah, simply go to landconquest.com. It's a school community, if you're familiar with school, the platform. And we've got the training program in there. We've got a bunch of other resources. And we're about almost at 3,000 members right now. So I know it's going to be growing considerably over, over this year. So it's uh, kind of an exciting ride. So. Definitely. Okay. I like this person's name, Boston. Kind okay. of cool name. Yeah. Um, hey guys, new to the community, but excited to get this going. First batch of mailers going out tomorrow to a list of about 800. I'm planning to mail weekly and wondering if anyone has data on how many mailers on average it takes per deal. I think you do have information. Yeah, for I do. Well, for us, what we do, we focus on a lot of the larger properties. We're not, we're not really focused on buying a you know, half an acre property somewhere or something like that. Like most of our properties are larger. 
rural type properties. So I say that because you're probably going to you would probably get a better a better response or better return on your mailers if you focus on smaller properties. You can get a lot more deals per letter sent. So the types of properties that we focus on, it costs us about thirty five hundred dollars in mail uh, for each property that we buy. How many mailers is that? I think eight thousand pieces of mail, maybe something, something like that. Yeah, there per yeah. Deal. Each mailer is a little bit over fifty cents. Okay. So. Yeah. Okay, Colby says, letter with a check design. Has anybody tried sending letters with the checks on them to where it looks like there's a check in the window of the letter to get them to open it? Yeah, so that's um, that's kind of a, I guess, a, a common direct mail technique, you know, send people this kind of fake check looking thing. And people, you know, you could put the offer amount on the fake check and some people might get really excited and, you know, think it's real or something like that. I don't know. But, you know, I've, I've actually talked to our rep from the mailing service that we use. And by the way, if you are interested in, in using the mailing service that we use, we've got a special discount, too. Uh, that we can link up. It's a uh, rocket print and mail. But if you just simply go to resources.landconquest.com, I've got a link there that will give you a special kind of pricing if you if you click through the link and sign up for through our affiliate link there. So anyhow, uh, I've had discussions with our rep from there who obviously sees lots of right. different you know people doing things and. She's just not sold on it. They provide that service and everything like that. But her thing is that the the best responses and the best uh, return you're going to get are from what we do, which is the two-page letter, kind of offer letter, and a uh, letter, which is page one, and then page two is actually the, the actual purchase mm-hmm. agreement. The fake checks, you know, you might get people opening it and kind of looking at it, but a lot of people view those as kind of scammy scammy yeah Yeah. Yeah. she said people there's been reports of like people actually like calling from the bank and really upset with like that they're not able to deposit this check and all all these kinds of things so i mean if you want to go down that road or whatever and experiment with it then then maybe it's you know it's something you could experiment Mm -hmm. with but i don't i don't know of any other land investors that are having a lot of success with it doesn't mean it's not possible it's just just kind of what i hear Mm -hmm. adam says why not offer over 50 percent it seems to me the go-to is to offer 50, 30 to 50% of market value. That's great when people take it. I seem to get a number of people happy with 60 to 65, which are better margins than my house flips, but not low enough for lenders to partner with me. Any lenders out there willing to lend on something like this, but maybe take a bigger cut? Is anyone wholesaling these? And if so, what channels are you using to market them? That's yeah. from Adam. I don't know if I said yeah, that. Yeah, Adam. Okay, so this is an interesting thing. Uh, obviously, you would think... You know, logically, you would think, hey, like if I can buy this property for 60 percent of its retail value, then I can resell it and still make money and every, everything would be happy. And it's and it's better than I can do on homes. You know, mm-hmm. that's still. Like, oh, yeah, of course. You it know, would be, I might, right? like, you might be buy a home at like 80 percent of value or something like that. But the problem is the the financing side of things. So you can get hard money for homes and, you know, hard money loans for, for homes. And obviously you could simply just make that spread if you wanted to, you know, 20, 30,000, whatever the case may be. And everyone's happy. The lender makes money. But the problem is that homes, the value many times are much more defined. The value, the exit price on the homes is much more clear. It's easier to figure out. With land, especially a lot of the rural properties, it's kind of it's kind of vague. It's more of a it's a combination of 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 uh, art and and numbers. And you've got to you know there's no two properties that are exactly the same. You've got to kind of take the information that you have and come up with your best estimate for a resale price. So it's not uncommon that we might think, hey, I think I can sell this property for a hundred thousand, and then you know we try and we try to sell it for that amount. The market is saying it's not worth that. You know, mm-hmm. like we don't sell it, and we might have to sell it for seventy thousand or something. You like need that. a safer cushion, is what it comes down to. That's exactly right. Yeah, you need that by buying it at a lower, you know, percentage of what you think it's worth. You're giving yourself that cushion that you need to account for any downside. Now you might sell it for a hundred thousand, just like you thought, but sometimes things don't work out mm-hmm. right. And if you don't, if you're not leaving yourself with enough of a cushion, then you're going to get burnt. And, you know, the the whole issue is that the exit price is not clearly defined. No one will probably want to lend on it. They, they need to make something for the most part, right? Right. And so if it comes down to it and you have to sell it for 70 mm-hmm. and you paid 60, if mm-hmm. we're talking 60%, that doesn't really leave enough for costs 
and also for both for two people to get some money. Yeah. Because you've added more people to it. Yeah. Maybe if you're funding it yourself, you'd be happy with it. You know? Yeah. And, and it just comes down to risk. The higher you go on that percentage, the riskier it's going to be. Mm-hmm. So your risk, if you don't watch it, you know, you're going to push it in a lot of those situations and you're going to get burnt. Right. You are. Ready for the next question? I'm ready. Um, John has a question. Postcards. Has anyone had success mailing postcards? If so, did you put offers on them? This is another thing. You know, most land investors send a letter, the two page letter. You know, it looks kind of like they're getting a bill in the mail or something like that. It's the clear windows. You know, it gets it opened. It looks mm-hmm. official in some capacity, I guess. Without looking scammy. Without looking scammy. Or yeah. junk. Right. So there's not a lot of land investors that use postcards. I'm not saying it's not something that can't work, mm-hmm. but, you know, I'm, I'm thinking maybe a lot of investors don't use it for a reason. I think there's something there, though, that you could potentially use it for follow up. Mm-hmm. Potentially, you know, you send them an offer and then you send them a postcard follow up. You, you put, you know, have, you have a regular rotation if you've got a mm-hmm. defined list that you're sending to or you're mailing to regularly. I think personally that may be the best use of the postcards, maybe something else in the mix there. Or maybe, you know, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you test it and it works out great mm-hmm. for you. You put an offer on there and it gets amazing results and prove me wrong. I don't know. Well, I'm the primary mail sorter at our home. Uh-huh. Um, and I don't really look at postcards because I know it's all. Yeah. You know, it's think, a promotional type thing. You know, mm-hmm. it's something Ma- that you're probably not interested right. in. Right. Maybe you have two seconds to catch my attention. Like if it was something as I'm literally throwing it in the trash that caught my eye and I don't know what that is. I don't know if it's words. I don't know if it's a color. I don't know. Well, um, I did pull something out of the mail though and give it to you. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, so I saw that. I read it. Yeah. It was interesting. It was a, it's kind of a, a big page like this, but it was kind of like sent like a bigger, postcard. Right? It might have been a little bit bigger, but it was uh-huh. rent. It, it looked like it was a handwritten thing. Mm-hmm. On one side, you, yeah. Yeah, exactly. What about this, Heather? What about if you had a picture of the property with an offer price on it? Would that grab your attention? If it was my house, it'd offend me, I think. I'd be like, this is too, you're like creeping on me. What about a satellite image of your piece of land? I, with yeah, like, that's what I'm not sure. Maybe, mm-hmm. maybe if it was like picture of that, okay, and it's like kind of like a black and white with like a red outline. Mm-hmm. If I recognize it's even my property, that's yeah, the problem. Yeah, you might not. <laughs> I might think it's like, okay, whatever. I don't know. I need to think about that. As I go through the mail, what stops me? You know, I, yeah, maybe there's someone that really gets it. I, everything I've seen, it doesn't. Uh-huh. Um, I did open up today. I thought this was interesting. You got um, uh, something in the mail and it was like, you know, like when it's like tax documents and it's like the perforated on each side and you have to mm. open up this side and this end, or it's like a credit card pin number, you know, right, this end. Yeah. And it came to you, which, sorry, I opened your mail. I created, created federal fence right there. Fraud there. I didn't even look at the name on it. So there we go. I opened it up and I peel it off and I, I opened it up and it was like, I think it was for like blinds or something. Mm. And I was like, what? Mm-hmm. They did, but it got me to open it. Yeah. So maybe there is a way to get creative. I don't know. I need to, I'll, I'll keep when I open the mail. And I guess that's the takeaway is that was you open up your mail. See what catches your eye. Yeah. You know, see like, like just if, if you're thinking, I'm just going through it, see what you see, you know, ask somebody else, talk to other, you know? Yeah. And I think it might be different demographics have different feelings. On, you know what I mean? I don't know. With marketing, it's all about experimentation, mm-hmm. you know? So obviously there's probably a lot more that we can do experimenting with different types of mail and things like that. So, so maybe I'll put that on the list of things to do. To it's out. like we always say it's starting another business because if we, we, if we allow ourselves to do this and we're like, we're going to figure this out, yeah. you know what I mean? Like we're going to commit to it and you guys are going to hear about it for like the next, <laughs> you know, I learned this new color. But yeah. Did I forget anything? No, that's about it. Okay. Yeah. Where can everyone find you? Yeah. On Instagram and TikTok. TikTok, TikTok, uh, TikTok <laughs> is at partner with Pete. Mm-hmm. Why is it partner with Pete? We didn't mention that. Oh, part. partner with Pete. And and if you're you're missing the partner with Pete program, it's uh, I feel bad for you. No, par- par- partner with Pete is our funding program, meaning that uh, we will partner with you on your deals. Mm-hmm. So, as an investor, if you find a deal, go to partnerwithpete.com. You submit the deal on there. If it looks, I'll review it. If it looks like a deal to me, I will agree to fund the deal. And we can partner on that, but not just fund the deal. We take it one step further or 10 steps further Mm -hmm. than that. We plug it into, we basically handle all the parts of the process from that point forward. We've got a a large and qualified team build out at this point. So we'll handle every single part of the the deal, you know, the transaction on the buy, the transaction on the sell, 
the due diligence, which is extensive, any value add, you know, like we need to get brush clearing or survey or any of that kind of stuff. We'll front the cost for all that kind of stuff and get it done. Coordinating with a broker or agent, negotiating deal, getting that all done. So basically oh, every part like of the process. Stuff. And the best part is at the end of the day, we split the profits 50-50 with the investor that brought us the deal. What's cool about that is that there is no downside for the investor. Mm -hmm. Say we agree to do a deal and we lose money, that loss comes on us, not the investor. We don't go to the investor and say, oh, you owe us you know, $10,000 because we lost some money on this mm -hmm. deal. And there are no qualifications, no you know, credit check, none of that kind of stuff. It's just simply, you bring a great deal, we agree to partner and fund it, and then you sit back and wait for the, the wire transfer when it sells. So. My favorite part. Yeah. yeah. So if you want to see some case studies on that, we've been doing some interviews with some people that we've been doing the Partner with Peak program with. We've got them posted on our YouTube channel, which is at Turning Profit. Obviously, the podcast is posted there. And then we're trying to do a video like that uh, every Thursday as well. And then we're obviously available on audio, all the major audio platforms uh, as well for the podcast. Podcast platforms, yeah. yeah. So you can watch it on a video, you can watch it or listen to it on podcasts. And then, but um, our YouTube channel does have additional episodes of yes. different types of things. Yeah, some really cool content mm -hmm. on there. We're really trying to do some neat things. So he's trying. I'm trying. I'm just kidding. It's great. Um, okay. Well, I think that wraps it up. Um, it's been a pleasure as usual. Yes. Yeah, same here. Heather. And I'll see you next week. We'll see you then. Or maybe later today. Okay. Okay. We'll, all right. Bye. bye. Thanks.